Uh, okay, well, th there's much that we could also say about regulation and, and uh, you know, to what extent was this all caused by deregulation and so on and so forth, but uh, and I'll gladly take that in the uh, question period too, and I've, I've covered that in a section of this book I, I, I did for next year, and I'm sorry I've got that on the brain, but that's like all I've done, and it's just terrible. Like every night I have to go down to that dungeon from hell to sit there and finish this project. And normally I love working on books, but for some reason this one just took me forever. And like, you know, there's always something great going on and I can't participate in it because I'm in, I'm in working, so it's, it's a little bit on the brain. But I do want to say a little something about what it is that they propose to do to get us out of this. How do we get us out of this whole mess that we're in? We've got unemployment at very high levels for a very long time. And this is going on, 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 and on. So what's the solution? Well, the solution that's proposed is you know, fiscal stimulus, monetary stimulus, bailouts, things of this nature. And I, what I first want to point out is something that Robert Higgs, a great economist, points out. He says that you know, there is something called regime uncertainty. Regime uncertainty is this phenomenon whereby investors hesitate to invest because they don't know what the freaking heck the government is going to do from one day to the next. Who in his right mind would expose his capital in a situation like that, where from one day to the next you don't know what, what, what's going to be done to the dollar, you don't know what the fiscal policy is going to be, you don't know what the tax policy is going to be, you don't know what the regulatory policy is going to be. I mean, then there's a huge regulatory reform bill that people barely know what, what's in it. It gives a hundred different times in that bill. It says, the agency shall determine, the agency shall decide, which of course means, as usual, the big players will have their chance to rig the game by just getting in cozy with the agency, and so on and on. And in fact, these firms have already met with regulators over 500 times to discuss the Dodd-Frank bill. So you get that, nobody quite knows the terms. Then the healthcare thing, then all this other stuff. You think this might be leading to a little bit of regime uncertainty? Like, you know, maybe now is not the time? And likewise, in the 1930s, that's precisely a factor in why was private investment so slow to rebound in the 1930s? Well, Higgs gives some empirical evidence to suggest that one important aspect is precisely regime uncertainty. Nobody quite knows what the regime is going to do, and the regime is extremely hostile to business. So it could be anything. Nobody knows from one day to the next. So that's one problem. Uh, secondly, of course, monetary stimulus, we, we understand from the analogy and metaphor we've talked about here, that, that obviously that's not going to help. I mean, if, if anything, that might perpetuate the problem that might keep some of these phony, bubble-induced investments going, but why would that be what we'd want to do? That would be like keeping the master builder building an unbuildable house. We don't want to do that. We want to stop that, get out of the way so that entrepreneurs can figure out what, what in fact ought to be done. Now, when it comes to fiscal stimulus, oh my goodness gracious, fiscal stimulus, and, and, and the, the arguments against fiscal stimulus have typically been, well, the stimulus wasn't great enough, it, it was too late, it hasn't been done robustly enough, there's too much pork in the stimulus, whatever. All, all these sorts of arguments which completely miss the point. The point being that, of course, where does the money for the stimulus come from? Is it just, did, did we get some windfall check somehow from, you know, from Zeus? I mean, like, where, how, where did the money come from? So the money either comes from uh, borrowing, so there's a lot less available to the private sector to invest, in, uh, or it comes from taxing, or it comes from printing it. Well, you know, these resources don't come out of nowhere. Now, the sophisticated response to this that some Keynesians will give you is, yes, 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 I agree with you that in normal conditions, during full employment, if the government spends money on a bridge project and creates jobs there, it's true that all it's doing is just destroying other jobs by siphoning money out of the private sector and throwing it into the public. So, yeah, 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 we get that. But the problem, they say, is that resources are idle right now in a recession. We've got a lot of stuff just sitting there, a lot of people just sitting there. So it's not like if we have a bridge project, we're taking the resources away from a perfectly good private use. These resources have no private uses. They're idle. Well, nice try, but that argument doesn't work either. But one of the reasons it doesn't work is the practical one. You would have to design the fiscal stimulus programs so that they correspond exactly, and they would need exactly the resources and only the resources that have been unemployed. So you would need, if, if you're going to engage in a bridge project in Houston, for example, are we absolutely sure that, every, that, that all the workers that you would need to build that bridge will all happen to, you, you'll, there'll be enough 
such unemployed, qualified bridge builders within commuting distance of Houston? Well, no, I mean, probably that's not going to be the case. You're going to have to get these people from some other line of work, which means the private sector loses them and can't compete with the kind of salaries that government can offer. So there is a diversion of resources. Or think of the material resources necessary to go into bridge building. These have to be also bid away from the private sector, which is doing something else with them, uh, typically. But more important is, how come we're never curious about why the resources are idle? Why do we have idle resources? I mean, this is, this is one of Krugman's great problems, is he actually said not long ago that he found it extremely frustrating that so many people were wondering about how we got into this mess instead of looking into how we can get out of it. As if there's no connection between how we get into it and how we get out of it. And likewise, well, we got all these idle resources. Well, why? Where'd they come from? Could it be they're idle? Because initially they were set to work in production projects that turned out to be, you know, unsustainable. And could this actually be the, the net result of an Austrian business cycle working itself out? And the idle resources are just the leftover wreckage from the previous boom. Well, and then, I, I talked a little bit about this depression of 1920, where, you know, you had 12.4% unemployment, you know, substantial declines in production, 56% decline in wholesale prices. I mean, Ben Bernanke would be having fits and hospitalize the government. You're just you know, create money, go crazy. Well, the Fed didn't actually, you can see this on the, uh, the St. Louis Fed website, the Fed didn't actually turn the money supply around until 1922. The depression of 1920 was already over by 1922. The federal government uh, cut spending, cut spending by about a half. And again, we did not, and, and in fact, wage rates fell. The reason wage rates had to fall is that we like, we like seeing people earn lower wages. But prices were falling dramatically. So if wages stay the same and prices fall, that means everybody's getting a wage, a wage increase during a depression. Can't, can't really do that. So nominally, they have to come down as well. Once that was allowed to happen, the thing cleared itself out. Problem, problem was solved. We did not actually have this problem of if prices keep falling, you get the end of the world. If everything's allowed to adjust to this, it corrects itself. And that is indeed what happened. We get no mention of this typically whatsoever. So what we need to do today, it seems to me, and then I'll, I'll take just a few minutes to talk about the, the, the big thing that's facing us. Uh, of course, what we need to do today is promote the ideas of the Austrian school. Of course, they have much more to say than just uh, you know, fiscal stimulus isn't going to have the effects that you want it to have, or business cycles are set in motion by the interventions of the Federal Reserve and so on and on has a lot to say about a whole lot of things. It's all very interesting. And a lot of people wonder, yeah, I'd love to get to know about this, but I do have an actual life. I got a family, I got a job, I have hobbies, I have other things I want to do. Uh, so what, um, what can you do for me? And I am so ahead of you, if that was your question. What, how can I, too, learn Austrian economics, you say? Well, I, got, I get a lot of people who write, after they read Meltdown, they say, this is great, now what are some more things? And I did actually in the appendix point out that I, I finally decided I would sit down and just draw up a, a list of things to get started with. And 90% of the things on that list are free. You don't have to buy them. They're free. You could listen to them online, put them on your iPod, watch them online, read them online. Almost all of it's free. And it's, it's organized from beginner to intermediate to, to advanced. And all different things you might want to get started with. And you can find things that interest you. And then take it as far as you want to go. And I put that, I, I have the domain name, learnaustrianeconomics.com. I can't believe that domain name was available. I bought that. Best seven bucks I ever spent. It was fantastic. <laughs> so please look into that because it would really, I mean, it's going to change, to some degree, it's going to change the climate of opinion. The, the fact that so many young kids are studying this kind of economics and going into the profession. The profession is actually grudgingly, but more and more, uh, acknowledging the Austrian school. You, you can actually, it's not a, it's not the kiss of death career-wise. You can, in fact, be employed if you are uh, an Austrian economist. So if, if we all knew this, imagine an informed public learning stuff that is just not taught anywhere and is prepared to defend, in, in effect, a free society. It's, it's very, very important. Okay, but now, lest, you, lest, lest I leave you with, with too much confidence that, well, you know, everything will turn around because we'll all learn. I, I, um, I want that to happen. I want everybody to learn. But if we don't learn now, we're going to learn very quickly. And the reason for that is the problem that we are now facing. 
which is not simply the immediate problem of a stagnating economy. It's what's about to hit us in the relatively near future. 